I'm glad there's been some music, and I'm glad that the host has hyped you all up a little bit, because I was a little concerned starting off in the morning that everyone's going to be a little bit sleepy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm Kate, I'm Kate Stone, and it's such um, a pleasure to be here and a privilege to be here and to be on this stage and to share some things about my life and some, and some stories. Um, I was asked backstage, um, is it really true that there's only one slide? So I'm a little lazy, um, so I don't make any slides. Um, and I don't really have a script. So what I will talk about are just things I've learned in my life and that I feel, I just sort of, just from what I've gleaned from living my life and where I think things might be going, but also your presence and your smiles or frowns or whatever might influence a little bit what I say. So it's kind of a conversation, but I'm the only one speaking. Um, <laughs> I love those conversations. Um, <laughs> I tend to corner people in the hotel lobby and talk, to, talk at them for half an hour. Um, yeah, so my background is I'm a scientist, so, which basically just means I studied science at university. Um, but I think really I'm a creative. Um, so yeah, I studied electronics and then I did a PhD in physics. Um, and really more of my background is also, I think as a child, um, I just remember I was just fascinated with trying to create experiences or things in my bedroom. Um, one of my memories is hiding little switches and speakers and microphones um, in my bedroom, in the wardrobe, running the wires under the carpet, and then maybe crawling into the loft space, speaking through a microphone, calling my siblings into the bedroom and confusing them as to why, why my voice is coming out of a bookcase. <laughs> I, I also remember taking one of my dad's favorite books, which was Captain Hornblower, and I'm very ashamed to say I carved the inside of the book out. Um, I bought from the back of a magazine a radio transmitter. I hid it in the book and placed the book next to my parents, crept off to my bedroom, <laughs> tuned in the radio. Um, I realized that unhearing is more difficult than hearing, so... <laughs> so, yeah, be careful what, what you wish for. So I guess I've kind of, like, always been... <laughs> always just been fascinated with just creating experiences for people um, and not really about the technology, but I'm curious about technology as to how I can use it to, to create those, those experiences. So what I ended up doing is, is um, just exploring what you can do with printing, um, what you can do with conductive inks, um, and I don't know, maybe like, I don't know, 15 to 20 years ago, I bought a huge printing press, no clue what I was doing, um, and managed to put some conductive inks in there and started to make paper that you could touch that would then play some sounds, because I combined it with some of the similar electronics I was playing with when a child. So I brought a few of those things with me, and I will try and show you the types of things we do. Um, yeah. yeah, so just bear with me if I have to come over here and find things. Um, so this is what we do. We print conductive ink like this onto paper, and that creates the sensors. And then we stick a little bit of electronics on that sends signals through the ink. So it's pushing electrons backwards and forwards through the ink. And then when you touch it from the other side, it's a little bit like touching a smartphone screen. It knows where you've touched it. And then, oops, we put some graphics on. And let me see if I can get this to work. Um, you can, ugh, and I love making music remixes. So you can. Better, better. Touch Better. it in different places and create Better. a little remix. Better. I'm not a musician, but Better. I pretend that I am. Yeah, I think in life everything's a remix, so I love turning everything into a remix. Um, I may regret this, but I might pass this round. So try not to be too, <laughs> try not to be too disruptive because someone's giving a talk at the moment. Um, <laughs> um, let's see what else. Uh, um, this was a really, this was a really fun project. Um, my colleagues and I did for Capital One Bank in the U.S. Um, we did. Oh. We did a Bluetooth version of this. So in the bank, 
They turned the bank into a cafe. Like, it seems that most banks have become cafes in the US. I don't know how it is here. Um, I, went to my, I went to my bank recently to get some money, and they said they have no money. All they can offer me is a coffee. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Um, so we did these large posters, and they, they made these superheroes, and they did this beautiful graphics. So, oops. Turn it on. The Flexer. Unlimited financial flexibility. <laughs> I love that creativity. <laughs> the frugal master. Miraculous master of saving. <laughs> the unflappable optimist. Working tirelessly towards a better tomorrow. <laughs> so... Um, I might pass this round too. So really, just the idea is, what if a poster, an ordinary poster, you can touch it, and it has a graphic, and it talks to you, and plays some sounds? And that's what I'm really fascinated with. How can we allow the ordinary to become extraordinary, to have technology inside, to have technology that's invisible? Um, I'll pass this round too. Do you want to have a little play? Again, you know, I'm trying to do a talk, so keep it quiet. <laughs> um, <laughs> and... Um, one more thing, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, a few years ago, I made a notebook for musicians. So this is a notebook for singer-songwriters. And um, notebooks are supposed to play notes. That's my bad joke. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know if you can see, but I also put these lines in the bottom of the notebook. And I don't know if anyone knows what they're for, but they're for footnotes, which, again, I thought was funny, but no one else did. Um, <laughs> um, and then in the back, it has a fold-out piano, and it Bluetooths to my cell phone. Um, probably can't see it, but um, when you... Yeah. The idea is you can write your music, and then you have an idea of some sounds. And then you can play sounds on that, and then it folds back. Like that. So, yeah. This is the point where I wish I could play piano. I don't know if everyone, anyone ever saw the film Green Card. Um, I've had that scenario a few times where I've had the piano put in front of me and expected to play it, and, I, and then I have absolutely no clue. Yeah. <laughs> right, i put that away. Um, I'll pass this around as well. You can have a little look. Please give it me back. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, I'm just going to turn that off. Just bear with me a second. Let's get my notes. Right, yeah, so that's kind of like my background. That's what I do. I am just fascinated with making everyday things a little magical and, and, and connected to things. And then as I've been doing this and just kind of going on my adventures, I guess we all go on adventures. I love like hiking and disappearing into the mountains and getting a little lost. Um, which can be a little scary. Um, I have discovered I have animal magnetism. Um, unfortunately, not the right kind of animal magnetism. Um, one point in my life, I was gored through the throat by a wild deer, which was not good, but so luckily I can still talk. Um, that was a few years ago, and um, oh God, I did not even mean to talk about any of this. Um, a, a few months ago, I was lying on a mountain in California, and I woke up in the night because a bear was putting its claws on my legs. These are true stories, <laughs> but I'm, actu I'm actually here. So yeah, I go on my adventures, and I just, I just think about things. So I kind of started thinking about what the future might be like, and what the future might be like instead of thinking about technology and imagining all the tech in the future. We kind of visualize it, flying cars and all this big tech. What would it be like if we thought about the world, not about the nightmare that we're going to sleepwalk into, but the, the dream that we might want to choose to build? What if we, you know, to understand how humans work, who we are, what brings us meaning, what makes us happy, and think about those things, like really who, who are we, how are we connected, what type of future might we build? And I ended up with these six reasons. I don't know why it's six, it just kind of happened to be six. The first one is about tech. And it's the only one that's really about tech. And it's about invisible tech, which is kind of a little bit what, what I tried to show. Um, and it just really fascinates me how much space there is inside absolutely nothing. In, in, the, in the 1900s and kind of 
well, sorry, in the 1800s and going to the 1900s, technology was really all about the big, about steam engines, about big things. And technology now is really all about the small. The American physicist Richard Feynman in, I think, 1959, gave a lecture where he said there's plenty of room at the bottom. And what he was talking about is when we can make things really small, we have an incredible amount of space. And I think he was also alluding to things like um, using a beam of electrons to pattern things rather than the big things that we might use. When I did my PhD, um, it was with the group that had originally invented the electron microscope, I think. And I was using this tool that could draw lines with a 10 nanometer spot size, which is 10 billionths of a meter. And I was using that to draw little circuits so I could pass electrons through something that was so small that electrons went through one by one. And I think you know, that then was state of the art, and maybe it's 25 years ago. And uh, electronics now has got to the point where we have transistors that have feature sizes that are pretty much down to that size. Things that are so small. We thought we couldn't pattern things smaller than light itself, smaller than the wavelength of light, which is a few hundred nanometers. Now we pattern circuits in the tens of nanometers. And I'm kind of fascinated by, we think about like looking through the telescopes at the edge of space and how big things get, but we rarely consider how much space there is when we get really small. Instead of going orders of magnitude big, we go orders of magnitude small. The amount of space that there is is, is phenomenal. We can fit more transistors now on a grain of sand than we could on an entire beach at the point when transistors were invented, which I think was about nine, 1947, I think, the transistor was invented. And it was only in 1961 that they put a transistor and a capacitor and a resistor together to make a chip. And in that time, we've come to something where we can have billions of transistors on, on, a, on a speck of sand. So I'm just really fascinated by, as tech gets small, it gets incredibly powerful, but it also disappears. It disappears into everything around us. You think of the technology of a vaccine that was, you know, the vaccine that was used to combat COVID. It's just, it's just in us. We don't, there's not these machines that are curing us, these big things. These are things that are inside us. And so I kind of just imagine that in the future, technology will be so small that it's just gone. You can't, you can't see it. You can walk into a room, cast a spell, touch something, it talks to you, kind of the world that Mary Poppins might have created. And that's kind of like where I started. What if we wake up one day and all tech has gone? Um, I, I went to a conference a few years ago in Sweden, and for some reason they convinced me to inject a chip in my hand. Um, I've hardly ever used it, but I did use it once. I programmed it to be my car hotel room card key in a hotel in Baltimore. Um, <laughs> and I used my hand to open the door by waving my hand in front of the, the, the door key. I don't really know why I did that, but little anecdote. My brother once told me, he has a couple of challenges. One of them is that he sleepwalks, um, and the other is, well, it's not a challenge, but he sleeps naked. So he was in a hotel room once, drank too much, <laughs> slept walked out of his hotel room naked into the corridor um, and, and is locked out of his room and all he could do is get the little cloth and go to reception. If he had a chip in his hand, he'd be fine, he'd be able to get back <laughs> in his room. <laughs> so just, yeah, imagining all tech is gone and it's, and it's invisible. Um, okay, so the second one is nostalgia. Humans are very nostalgic. This is a beautiful theatre. It looks very old-fashioned, and I think we love it because of that. And nostalgia makes us feel that we're, we're nostalgic for a past where we thought things were better, but they never really were. I do believe that things are better now than they ever have been. But nostalgia kind of paints things in a way where we feel they are better. So we tend to design and want to cr create and crave things that look old-fashioned. So we invent tech to make things new and shiny and look high-tech, and we could be in a really high-tech, futuristic-looking theatre, but I do believe that in the future, we'll crave this more. Um, you know, we have like amazing digital photography, digital cameras, yet some people still want to use an old camera with film. And, uh, and I, as we probably all used to use a camera with film, um, I remember when I used to do that, if there was like some lens flare or there was like some light got in the camera, and it's like, it was really bad. It was, it was not a good thing. And I was speaking to someone recently who, who was saying, 
They have a camera, it's a little beaten up, a little bit of light gets in, their photographs have this light coming across them. And they love the fact that you can see the imperfections in things. They like the fact that things look, look a little old fashioned. We don't want things to be perfect. I think that imperfection is the hallmark of reality. And the more we try and create tech to make everything and everyone look perfect, I think the less real things start to look. So, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, I think, just think it's, it's beautiful to recognize that, but it's also important to recognize that the things we're nostalgic for didn't really ex necessarily exist. But when you combine nostalgia with invisible technology, that's when I first started to sort of imagine a future like looking like this, but with all of this invisible technology. The third, oh, I can hear the poster somewhere. Um, <laughs> the third thing is friction. And we often tend to say we want to remove the friction from a user's journey in something we might create. But I think friction is actually really important. And we think, think about the journey of technology has been about removing friction from our lives. So from the very beginning, how to recreate fire, a wheel, a plow, a printing press, a telephone, transportation. Um, all of these things are about making our lives easier, amplifying our strengths, and keeping us safe. But the more technology we've added, and the more we've removed our need to do things, the more we've removed our sense of agency, our sense of purpose. And I believe that friction is actually really important. Friction is what makes every moment meaningful, mindful, and memorable. When you actually have to do something, when you actually have to peel some vegetables, prepare some food, chop some wood, walk somewhere, you have to actually physically do something, it slows you down, it brings you into the moment. The thing that you do, you start to think about why you're doing it, and so it brings meaning to that. And the fact that you've had to do that makes it memorable. So I kind of think there's good friction and there's bad friction. There's friction that frustrates, and there's friction that actually brings that meaning. If, if you to create some experience with a product, to create some experience for a brand, and you make it so seem, seeming, so just nothing happens in it at all, no one would remember having that experience. So you kind of want to build that friction in so that someone has a journey as, as they experience that product. So friction is really good. Um, imagine if sex had no friction and you couldn't feel anything. <laughs> that wouldn't work so good either. Um, so I think that if we combine that, I want to chop some firewood. I want to grow my vegetables. I want it to take six months for that food to appear. I want to prepare that food. Um, and you've probably all heard the stories where when they started to make um, cake mixes um, and they realized that people didn't have a sense of agency. I think this was in the 40s or 50s. So they, they made it so that you had to add an egg so that um, people had some agency and felt that they were actually making that. And then in the 80s, um, they came out with microwave meals. So all you do is you put this little box in the microwave, press the button, two minutes, you go and sit, watch TV, you have to do nothing. It's really easy. Whereas now, that's not what we want. Now we want meal kits that are delivered where you have to peel the vegetables and prepare the food. And so I think we will have more and more things like that. So you kind of combine that into the mix as well. Um, like, where, where are we? Um, the fourth one is about mind. Um, I'm not a psychologist, and th you know, these are all things that just come to me as I'm you know, lying in a forest trying to avoid a bear or a wolf or something. Um, I believe we have two halves to our mind, our inner mind that's in our body and our outer mind that is everything around us. And I define mind as whatever I use to form my thoughts, whatever I use to think. So my brain's kind of the organ that you know, does the computing, but what I use to think <coughs> If we were to say to someone, for example, where do you have your best ideas? You might say, um, when I'm in the shower, when I go for a walk, um, if I'm smoking or something. So if you use that thing to have your ideas and your thoughts, then it must be part of your mind. And we use that to think. You think of something like a spider. It uses its web to think. It's outside its body. It's how it knows something's there. It's how it can sense its environment. If you move a spider from a web, it's probably no longer really a spider. If you take any other animal out of its environment, which it uses to think, and put it in a zoo, you've literally pulled it out of its mind. 
And as humans, that's, that's what we're doing. We've removed ourselves from our environment. We've connected ourselves to our cell phones. When I go hiking and I stand on top of a mountain, I, I just started to like visualize these like field lines, because like, I'm a physicist, I guess. But I kind of like just imagine these colors of line, these colors of light coming into me. And there's five different, there's five colors, and each one represents a different one of my senses. So whatever I can see, it's just bringing in that data. Whatever I place my attention, that data's coming into me. Feeling the wind blow over me, feeling the temperature, hearing the sounds of the wind, or hearing some of the animals. All of that information comes into me, and those lines are what connect my inner mind to my outer mind. If I look, if I sleep under the stars, which I did recently on a mountain, which was amazing, um, um, actually just before I came on this trip, and see, see the Milky Way, I'm connecting myself to the Milky Way, and that information is coming into me. And so my mind now stretches as far as the Milky Way. Our mind is everywhere we've been, everyone we've met, everything we've seen, everything we've done, it's how we form our thoughts. That's why we say when we travel, we expand our mind, because we push, we push the physical boundary of where we are and where we can form our thoughts. If we would start to realize that our environment is our mind and it's how we think, I do believe we might design things differently. We might design a workplace differently. We might design a product differently, a school or a prison. Like we put people in a prison and expect them to come out without a criminal mindset, it's just, it's just fucking crazy. <laughs> because like our environment is like a set, it is a mindset, like a stage set. And it, it's, it, it's how we form our thoughts. So, I do think that whenever any of us design anything, any experience, any product, any journey, we are mind surgeons. We are designing the insides of people's minds. And if we understood that when we created anything, I think we would build a very different future. A, a, a future where we just recognize how we are all connected. Like everything I'm saying is connected to you. You are all part of me, I'm all part of you, because all of our minds overlap. And understanding that, I think, would enable us to create a very different world. Okay, I have two more, <clears throat> and I will try and be quick. Um, the fifth one is, um, is resourcefulness. Actually, I'm just gonna drink some water before I actually can no longer speak. So bear with me. <clears throat> you can chat amongst yourselves, it's fine. Right. Um, just before the pandemic, um, I was living in a house on a mountain just outside Woodstock, New York. I don't know how I really ended up there. I've already managed to push the boundaries of working from home. Uh, my job is in London, and somehow I now live on a mountain just outside Woodstock. Um, and um, also, I'd been to a conference in Chicago where they were talking about how to save the world, how to spend money on technology to make the world a better place, and all that. And we'd all flown there, and they were serving um, breakfast on plastic things, in plastic cups, from tubs of coffee, in plastic, from um, Dunkin' Donuts. And, and I'm, I have plant-based food, and there was no plant-based options, and it just really fucking pissed me off. And I just thought, how can we be at something where we're about trying to make the world better? No one can be bothered to even attempt some plant-based thing or give me at least an option. I don't care what anyone else does, but at least at an event like this. Serving food on plastic, and at the end of the day, I helped clear up and threw all this stuff in the trash. It, 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 and I went home, and, and it just really made me think about the things that I buy and what I use. So I consulted my, what I call my kitchen oracle, which is the trash can in the kitchen, dug through and looked at everything that was in there, and I saw plastic tubs for salad, and plastic bags for bread, and plastic cartons for, for milk. And so what I um, decided to do is to try and change my diet to reduce my waste, kind of like a play on words. Um, and so I started to, I bought a flour mill. I'd mill my own grain to make my own flour, to make my own pasta. I set up some hydroponics to grow some spinach. Um, I had um, so soybeans to make my own soy milk, to make my, I'm a little extreme. It's, I mean, it, it took me six hours to make a lasagna, which is a little crazy, but it was a lot of friction. It brought me a lot of meaning. I felt very nostalgic and all the tech was invisible. Um, and it did, <laughs> and it made me really happy. Um, 
When I was a kid, there's something else I remember. My gran used to say, you should cut your coat from the cloth at hand. And I always used to imagine going in the lounge and seeing a coat shape cut out of the curtains, but that, that never actually happened. Um, and she was really trying to say, try to use what is around you to meet your needs. And that's kind of what I was doing. I was trying to meet my needs from the things that are around me. Anyway, that was 2019. And then COVID happened. And, and everyone's like, you know, the shit hits the fan and everyone's running for toilet paper and <laughs> pasta. And I'm kind of sat on my mountain going like, I'm kind of okay, thanks. <laughs> Milling my flour, making my pasta. Um, and what it made me realize is that resourcefulness leads to resilience. When we meet our needs from the things that are around us, we are inherently resilient to changes in our environment. That's how re the reason why we all exist, really, because we're adaptable to change. Um, and, you know, so if we can do that, shop more locally, create more of what we need, not only does it sort of satisfy some of the other things to do with mind and friction, it also deals with things like global supply chain issues and all of those things because we're dependent on such long supply chains and having things come from so far and we don't use things that are made locally and really reflect local needs. So that's why I put that one in there. I do believe if we create what we need from what's around us, we will be inherently resilient and safer and more likely to survive. And if we understand that, we will do it because we need to do it to survive. The last one is another thing to do with COVID. Um, I happened to meet some people in the forest and they told me to buy a radio just to be safe. So I bought this radio, I bought a ham radio. Um, and I had to study and get my license, so I became a nerdy ham radio operator. Um, and um, and, during, and oh, my call sign is KD2 RYD, Kilo Delta 2 Romeo Yankee Delta. Um, that's who I am. Um, and um, during the pandemic then, um, a few of us on our radios around Woodstock, we would meet at 8.35 every morning and speak on what's called the 8.05 repeater. Um, and just why it stuck in my mind was, so it was started by this guy called Paul, Paul, AC2UQ, and exactly at 8.35, the radio would crackle alive. You could hear people just getting their coffee and getting ready. And then he'd say, this is Paul, AC2UQ. If anybody's out there, come with your call sign now. And one by one, people came, you know, with it on the, on the radios, and there's about 10 or 12 of us. And we just had this conversation. Only one person could speak at a time. We'd speak in order. We'd speak for two minutes. And we would just give a little mundane detail about our life, um, one by one, and then, you know, get on with our day. And what I realized is just that hearing the random people around me, hearing the mundane part of their life, uninterrupted, um, it built into this really rich tapestry of, of just hearing what people in my community were doing. And so that's why the last one is, is really about community. When we realize that the quietest person in the room may have the most to say, when we give space for every single voice to be heard, to, 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 to say what they have to say, we build a much, much stronger community. And again, we are resilient. If we only connect with the people around us who are similar to us, we are vulnerable to something that could disrupt and destroy our lives. We need to connect with as many people who are different to us as possible. As an engineer, that's how I imagine you make a system that's just really, really strong. So when we recognize the value of community and connecting wherever possible with people who are different to us, we will build a really strong society where we have access to all the information we might need to have. And so when I tie all of those things together, that's how I imagine if we really understood that, we might build a future we want to live in rather than this nightmare we're going to sleepwalk into. Um, and if I just, really just the last point, if I just imagine that we're on this spaceship called Earth that's traveling through space at the speed of time. <laughs> um, and there's two dials. One of them is our mental health. It's in the red. The other one is our planet health. It's in the red. If we don't do something to change how we live our lives and how our mental health is and how we treat our planet and how our home is, like, we you know, we worry about the survival of the, of the planet. The planet's fine. It's us that are going to be fucked unless we do something about it. So if we don't do things to bring meaning to our lives, 
if we don't have community around us, which we all saw during COVID, how much that affects our mental health. And if we don't treat our environment differently, we're not going to have a future. So I really hope we can understand these things and build this future that we might want to live in that perhaps looks a little more like the past than the present, but really is very futuristic. So thank you very much.